All right, hi, I'm Josh Rackless, and I am running for MPP of Eglinton Lawrence with the Green Party. And like I like to say, well, I don't like to say it, but I, I'm an honest guy, so I do say it. Uh, I am not an expert in every subject, and so um, I like to consult experts and find out what the truth is on situations. And I also like to consult uh, the public who might have first hand knowledge of things that maybe I don't have first hand knowledge of. So, uh, I have with me today and a real life teacher because education is a big topic during the election and uh, this is Jennifer G. Hello Jennifer, welcome to, uh, I don't have a name for my show yet but uh, maybe it's just Josh Talks to People. Nice, okay. and, nice and punchy, very simple. Uh, well, I'm people, so that makes sense. You are people and if there's noise in the background that is the, uh, that is the streetcar that keeps going by uh, which is annoying but I love public transit so it's kind of a love-hate situation. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, we have, you are a teacher. I am. I'm a high school teacher in Ontario. Okay. And, uh, what do you think of the election situation here? My primary concern with the election right now is the possibility that the Conservatives will get back into power in the province. And in Ontario, they have not been in power for eight years. And I was a teacher when they were in power last time under Mike Harris. And it was awful, disgusting. Uh, I felt it was basically a war on education and a war on students. And I hated it. So um, I'm scared at the possibility that, that there would be a conservative government in provincial power. So what you're saying is you're not sure how you feel about the situation. <laughs> uh, just, just to, uh, where are you a teacher? Is this relevant? Should we know? Uh, I'm, Eto I'm in Etobicoke, which yes. is basically a suburb of Toronto. Yes, okay. So within Ontario. And yep. uh, so what uh, What are certain issues that uh, I guess the, the Conservatives are talking about? Oh, you're a high school teacher. We mentioned that. Yeah. It's probably relevant as well. Yep. Uh, and what, what issues are they talking about that maybe you would disagree with that you think, uh, you know, we should do things differently in terms of education? Well, okay, I mean, I think there's always room to improve every system. So I'm not a person to say, well, we've always done it that way, so let's keep doing it. I'm not opposed to new ideas, particularly if they're going to help students and help the educational system. Mm -hmm. However, if we remember, infamously, John Snowblin, former education min minister under Mike Harris, mm -hmm. uh, famously said, in a moment of honesty, rare honesty, I think, that... We need, we, the conservatives, we need to bankrupt and create a crisis in education. Mm. That's a direct quote. Well, why did, um, why did I believe he... he said a useful crisis, actually. That's a direct quote. Um, we need to bankrupt and create a useful crisis in education. Now, and the... that's what the conservatives went about doing. That sounds <laughs> like the uh, Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine, where you know they sort of create a crisis or they take advantage of a crisis in order to sort of achieve their agenda. Is that kind of the idea? Absolutely. And we see the Conservatives doing it in this election, too. It's not about education specifically, but, for example, this whole thing about chain gangs and really getting tough on criminals and this whole sort of ideology creates a crisis. The facts and the stats point to the fact that there has been a decline in crime, both violent and nonviolent, in Ontario in the last eight years. So you take a situation where crime is actually... Uh, the situation in crime is actually getting better, and you create a, a crisis and say, oh, we need to get harder on those criminals, these awful criminals, and people start thinking, oh my God, the criminals are taking over. And it's the same thing with education. Um, the reality is in the last eight years, we've had a really um, calm, peaceful situation in education. We've had two four-year collective agreements um, put in place by the provincial government, the current provincial government which meant that we only went to the bargaining table, we only went to negotiate twice. If it was the Conservative government, we would have had to have gone four times already. They like to renew the collective agreement every, every two years max. Mm. So that causes more unrest because every time the collective agreement comes up, everything else is on the table. So not just pay, which is what Conservatives love to make collective agreements about, but for teachers it's things like class size. It's things like um, budgets that schools have for necessities for kids. Because the reality is if the schools don't get the money for the kids, often teachers pay it out of our own pockets. Mm. So 
It's things like that that are negotiated in collective agreements. By having a four-year collective agreement, it adds stability to the educational system. And parents don't have to worry about teachers going on strike or teachers getting locked out or teachers going on work to rule and their kids being, you know, their kids learning being interrupted or their extracurriculars being interrupted. So I can't stress enough, in my opinion, the importance of the four-year collective agreements and the attitude of respect that I think has been in the educational system in the last eight years, whereby teachers and the educational profession, as well as the educational system, have been respected. And that's not to say I've agreed with all the changes the current government has put in, but I've really been grateful for the fact that I haven't had to have that pit in my stomach stress every two years that, oh my God, we're renegotiating the collective agreement again. Now, could someone argue then, well, who, who really cares if you're comfortable or not, if, you know teachers are coddled and we're wasting taxpayers' dollars and, uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess uh, uh, Tim Hudak wants to roll back teachers' pays. Could this be saving taxpayers' dollars? Well, okay, rolling back anyone's pay, if you're talking about pay that ultimately comes from government coffers, is going to save money. That's true. Yes. But interestingly, I don't see him talking about rolling, it back, rolling back, you know, MPPs, sorry, Josh, but MPP's wages or or the pre the, the premier's wages, hmm. you know. So we're talking. I mean, this is it, it get, will it save money? Yes, me reaching into your pocket and, and you know stealing your money saves my money too, but it's not a good idea. Right. I mean, I, my opinion would be that. I mean, I don't know if if that's where you want to save money. I mean, I don't think there's anything more important than than education, really. In, I mean, these yeah. are the kids that are going to become our doctors, our engineers, our artists. I mean, I don't know if that's the place you want to... I mean, so and you want the best people to go into the teaching profession, obviously. I don't want, uh, you know, people who aren't qualified coming in because, well, it's enough money and whatever. But uh, I was just uh, talking to uh, Paul Baker tonight, who ran federally for the Green Party, and I might do an interview with him as well. He has some interesting notions. He was saying uh, the elementary school system is working pretty well, but uh, high school seems to be falling apart. He was talking about how uh, teachers uh, teachers bully students, uh, students bully students. It's all sort of uh, swept under the table. Uh, he was talking about a math teacher he knows that uh, that didn't even speak English. That didn't speak English. It was somebody's teacher. Uh, you know the fact that people can come in and teach math even though they're not qualified. Maybe they just have a teaching certificate, so now they can teach math. Is there something? And, you know, I've had uh, a few girlfriends that are teachers, so I've heard some stories. Um, I have heard stories of sort of corruption or, or teachers mm -hmm. getting away with being incompetent. Uh, I don't know if this is something the conservative plan would fix. That doesn't sound like it has anything to do with that. In fact, it might make well, the problem worse. But Well, conservatives are floating the idea of merit pay. And this, this idea comes up whenever... Um, education is on the table and whenever we're talking about corruption in education and I'm the first person to say that I believe every profession has lazy people in it I believe every profession has people who who sort of um, take advantage I think there are a lot of business people who take advantage of their companies and go on three-hour lunches and bill golf trips or whatever I mean I mean I think corruption exists everywhere so he's talking Tim Hudak is specifically talking about merit pay um, which in theory, when you simplify it to its most basic things, sounds like a good idea. Basically, you pay teachers for the quality of their work. So better teachers get higher pay. And if you leave it at that and don't think any deeper about it, that on the surface sounds like a good thing. Hey, yeah, so bad teachers will get less pay and ultimately get weeded out of the profession. It's kind of like social Darwinism for teachers. Right. So but, you'd be out like in a flash. I'd be living high on the hog. Right. <laughs> um, but no, so the question becomes, how do you gauge good teaching? Attractive. And, and it, it's, it's challenging. Now, what happens in the states where merit pay is used, and the conservatives love to look to the states as though it's the beacon of all things positive, Right. Um, even now that George W. is no longer there. But, I mean, that's sort of where they look. Um, it's based on students' standardized test scores. So my pay as a teacher would be linked to my student's ability to perform well on a standardized test, which may or may not actually be testing their knowledge as much as it is testing their ability to take a test. Right. So 
So it also presupposes that all students start off on a level playing field. So that if I'm teaching in an inner city school and my students don't do as well on a, on a standardized test because they're all ESL learners, English as a second language learners, they don't have tutors, um, you know, they're facing all kinds of issues of marginalization. My kids are not going to perform as well as some upper middle class kids in a privileged area who have tutors. Mm -hmm. The performance on that test is in no reflection, either the really good, you know, good test scores because of the tutors or the really bad test scores because of the issues of marginalization are not a reflection on the teacher. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening in that merit based pay system actually is that bad teachers that we were talking about end up going to poor areas because the poor areas teachers won't do as well and they won't get paid as well. And then you end up with a system like there is in some parts of the states where the good teachers go to the rich areas where they're really needed the least, frankly, right. and the bad teachers end up going to the poor areas where they're needed the most. And it perpetuates cycles of oppression and marginalization. So merit-based pay is one of those ideas that conservatives love and people love because they don't have to think about it. But the implications of merit-based pay are awful. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why unions, for example, do fight merit-based pay. Not because they're trying to encourage people to not be excellent teachers, but because they question how we define that and how that gets assessed. Well, the Green Party platform does say they're against uh, standardized testing, right? Because they feel it doesn't measure the type of things we want kids to to become, you know, creativity, you know, it, uh -huh. it's a very specific form of measuring. Another initiative that the conservatives want to implement is exit exams for high school students. So it's based on the idea of SATs in the states, except instead of being an entrance type of exam, in order to graduate high school, you need to have passed this standardized exit exam in in high school. Not just passed, but done well on it. And the problem with any standardized test is that it tests a student's ability to take a test more so than it tests actual curriculum knowledge. In addition, it presupposes that the only skills students are supposed to have are in things like English, math, history, and subjects you can test. Well, what about artistic abilities, which you can't really put on a standardized exam? How do I test a student's artistic ability in a standard way across the entire province every student? I don't. And so what the conservative government is actually saying with standardized exit exams is that some things are worth knowing and some things aren't. And that doesn't bode well for funding. Well, or it's saying that some things can be tested and some things can't. So what, what is the solution then? We, we know that we don't like standardized testing, but we still have uh, many incompetent teachers who don't know anything that are taking advantage of the system. I don't think many is fair. I think some. All right. Well, I... You're the only good teacher I know, honestly. <laughs> but you had a lot of good teachers, I bet. Looking back on your own high school career or your entire educational career at uh, John Fisher Public School. Uh, yeah, probably had a few. But again, that was that was elementary school, right? I can't remember. Sure, okay. I'm sure I had some okay high school teachers. I did. Uh, but but how do you weed out the bad ones, or how do you, how do how do you test kids? I mean, so if we you know if artisticness is too ephemeral, we can't. Uh, but we already, see this is the thing, we already have curriculum expectations for every subject, including the arts. By having curriculum expectations, it gives teachers the flexibility based on their curriculum subject area to test or assess in the way that most makes sense. So I used to teach drama. It doesn't really make sense to have an exam-based, you know, paper and pencil exam in drama, which is a performative-based course. Same with music, same with visual art. And so curriculum expectations say by the end of the course, a student should be able to A, B, C. Now, how do I determine A, B, C? It's unique to the curriculum area. By having a standardized exam, you take that out and you say everyone learns the same way, everyone reports the same way, and everyone learns, um, can be graded in the same way using paper. And that's not true. Okay. But then how do you get into, you know, universities and, and qualify people for that? I guess it's just sort of up to the teacher's discretion, you know. Uh, well, we already, we already have a system in place for that, though. Okay. So what are, you know, what, uh, what do we have right now? Okay, so the Tories are proposing more, uh, you know, standardized testing, all of that kind of thing. More standardized testing and more report cards. They want to bring back a fall report card as well. 
Okay, and what's wrong with that? Um, I mean, I think we can get to the point of, um, of course, parents need to know how their students are do their children are doing. Absolutely. But I think it can get ridiculous to the point where I'm spending so much time reporting to you on how your kid is doing that I'm not actually helping the kid learn, <laughs> right? I'm going to be spending my time as a teacher constantly reporting. Well, you can over-report. We already have early warning letters that go home to parents that tell them at about a month to a month and a half whether or not their students are on track. Then we have midterm reports already. Then we have final reports. In addition, we have parent-teacher interviews. I mean, we can over-assess and over-report. It All gets right. ridiculous. Yeah, we can also over-beat this point. Um, so what uh, then is the current situation that the liberals... That was a joke. I was making a joke. Uh, what is the... Okay, so the conservatives are proposing this. Is, what do we have right now? Do we have all this standardized testing and all that? We have some standardized testing. We have a literacy test in grade 10, for example, that's standard across the province. We have EQAO testing um, for both math and languages at various grades, 9, 6. Is this the right level of uh, testing, or what would you improve? Well, to be fair, I no, I no longer teach in those particular subject disciplines, so it would probably be better to ask a math teacher whether they think the grade 9 EQAO math test is appropriate, or whether they're an English teacher, whether the grade 10 literacy test is appropriate. Okay, I mean, so, so overall we know what you're angry about. Um, is there anything that you would, uh, you know, do you have any suggestions for how to improve the system? I mean, there's, t there's tons of suggestions. Should we save that for the next video? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, we can save that for a whole other video, but... Um, I just wanted to say, because I was talking about this very issue with a friend of mine today, and the friend said, you know, you don't go back to the past. Just because Mike Harris was bad doesn't mean Tim Hudak is going to be bad. I agree. We can't paint all conservatives with the same brush. However, we can't also forget that Tim Hudak was a cabinet minister in the Mike Harris government. And Mike Harris is advising the Tim Hudak campaign. So to say that the past is the past and the present is the present and they're not at all related is naive at best, and I would argue dangerous. Well, all right then. Thank you, Jennifer G., for your uh, opinion as a teacher. And uh, I'm sure we'll come back to you to find out uh, your solutions for the, uh, the educational uh, situation that people might think isn't ideal, but maybe it is. Uh, all right. Thanks, Josh. I, okay, thanks for, uh, for joining us. Bye. Bye.